And now it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Roberto Trota. Roberto Trota is a theoretical cosmologist in the astrophysics group of Imperial College, London. He is one of the world's leading figures in astrostatistics, a new discipline focusing on the use of statistical methods to solve problems in cosmology and astrophysics. Roberto has held research positions at University of Geneva, the University of Oxford, as well as visiting positions at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Cape Town, l'Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris, and the University of California at Santa Barbara. Roberto has published more than 50 scientific papers, contributed to two books, and received numerous awards for his research, including Michelson Prize of Case Western Reserve University, the Lon Lord Kelvin Award of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, and a public engagement fellowship by the Science and Technology Facilities Council UK. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roberto Trotta. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for being here. I'm very pleased to be here tonight in such an amazing place. I love this city that sits on the edge of the big body of water looking towards where the sun goes down. I love its ups and downs, its ever surprising corners, <laughs> its story, and of course, its people. So this really is the perfect place for me to be giving the first of several talks about my new book, The Edge of the Sky. The book came out of a little idea that it should be possible to talk about very hard things in a straightforward way that all people can understand. The problem with student people like me, you see, is that sometimes we get carried away and speak about our work using words in a tongue that only other student people can understand. This makes it not possible to have a conversation with other people, people like you. After a little while, your eyes will begin to stare into empty space, and you probably walk away as soon as you can with a silent sigh, happy to have escaped. <laughs> a way to avoid all that is by talking with only the, ten, the most used 10 hundred words in our tongue. When I heard about this, I thought that it could be a fun, a fun idea to use it to explain the entire all there is. This is what my book is about, and what this evening is about. I'd like to share with you some of the ideas behind the book and the story of how this slightly crazy idea <laughs> became reality. So you might be forgiven, forgiven for thinking that this little uh, piece at the beginning sounded a little strange, and perhaps with George Bernard Shaw you thought that this is down to me having spent 10 years with the Brits, and as you know, uh, Britain and the United States are two nations divided by common language, and so perhaps <laughs> That's why this sounded a little strange, but actually no, that's not the reason. The reason is that uh, this was all uh, written using only the most used thousand words in the English language. The idea behind the very book that uh, is, is being published today, and I'm honored to be presenting to you tonight in this very special place. So just by way of background, as we heard a minute ago, I am a theoretical astrophysicist at Imperial College London, and my research in astrophysics and cosmology is about dark energy, dark matter, all of these unknown dark things, pretty useless dark things out there in the universe. <laughs> um, but I'm also a passionate uh, communicator of science. I really believe that one of the, uh, the main uh, roles of scientists in this day and age is to be able to communicate with the public and not just communicate in a top-down way, but even engaging the public in a two-way dialogue about those big concepts, those big ideas, those very fundamental questions about the reality of the universe, of the all there is, that we all share and we're all interested in. In particular, astrophysicists like myself, we are very privileged. We are in a position where the big science we do is science that naturally draws uh, people's attention. And, and wherever I go and give talks, I always find people being 
fascinated by the questions we ask, by the answers that we sometimes get, and by the even bigger questions that are still unsolved and the biggest mysteries in the universe. And so it's really our duty to uh, tap into this enthusiasm and to share in a dialogic way th the passion that drives our quest and the reason why we're spending big money, taxpayers' money, into this kind of uh, research, which is uh, as fundamental as, uh, as, as few other things, uh, in my view, uh, in, in our endeavor to understand our place in the universe. But uh, uh, trying to do that, we face, as scientists, we face some big hurdles. One, and perhaps the most obvious one, is the problem of jargon. We scientists, we tend to uh, speak in, in jargon simply because those are the words that we have, that those are the words of our trade, the words that we have chosen to, ex to explain our subject to our peers. But then, obviously, important questions and important ideas can get and do get lost in translation. Let me give you an example. Here is a, a paper from 1965 by these two gentlemen, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, who in 1965, working at Bell Labs in New Jersey, picked up using a, a big horn antenna a strange signal they could not explain away in, in any way. How, however hard they tried, they were picking up some noise in this microwave horn that they couldn't, they didn't expect and couldn't explain. And so after trying as hard as they could to get rid of that noise, they reluctantly came to realize that this was something actually that was quite important. And they had no clue what this was about. So the, the Princeton team of other scientists that at the time was working on uh, building such an antenna to actually pick up this noise um, told them what they were actually uh, picking up. And so they went on and published a paper in the Astrophysical Journal, a paper entitled a measurement of excess antenna temperature at 4080 mega cycle per second. <laughs> and this short paper, it's only one and a half pages long, was Nobel Prize worthy a few years later. What they really wanted to say, what they really meant by this title was, we have discovered proof of the Big Bang. <laughs> <laughs> that the universe had a beginning, and this beginning was a hot, dense state. And the, the leftover radiation was the noise that they were picking up with this microwave antenna, which has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. Well, they didn't know it themselves at the time. And that this is the, 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 the title they gave to that discovery. So you might think, well, this was 1965. Surely ideas and the uh, communication science with the public must have improved in the past, uh, past few decades. Well, fast forward to 1999. Here is another paper, again, in the Astrophysical Journal by Saul Permuter and collaborators. Now you can see science becomes harder. There were two guys in, in this fir first paper. There are about um, 25 guys. There's only a fraction of the authors here. In this new paper, science becomes harder simply because it's harder to make new discoveries now that all the low-hanging fruits, as it were, have been picked. <laughs> so this paper says uh, a measurement of omega and lambda from 42 high redshift supernovae. Now every time you see scientific papers, uh, Greek letters, that's a sign that people are trying to be smart, okay? <laughs> so they're trying to impress <laughs> their audience by using letters that uh, normal mortals do not understand. <laughs> and so the paper says on, goes on saying, we report measurements of the mass density, omega matter, and cosmological constant energy density, omega lambda of the universe, based on the analysis of 42 type 1a supernovae discovered by the Supernova Cosmology Project, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'll spare you the rest. What they're trying to say is that we found proof that 70% of the universe is being ripped apart by an unknown force field. Okay? And this paper won the Nobel Prize for Physics uh, a couple of years ago. And again, very hard for anybody but the uh, insiders to understand what this paper is actually about. Okay, this was 1999. You might think, well, now, surely, 21st century, things have improved. So let's look at this paper here by the CMS collaborator, so the CMS stands for Compact Muon Solenoid. That's a, um, a, a, a detector, particle physics detector at CERN the, uh, in, in Geneva, which is, the si which is about five stories high. Okay, that's what a compact detector looks like nowadays. <laughs> and this paper, you, you don't see authors' names on this paper because the CMS collaboration is uh, composed of give or take 5,000 scientists, okay? Observation of a new boson at a mass of 125 GeV with a CMS experiment at the LHC. Results are presented. Now we go over to the passive form to make it more, you know, more abstract still. 
are presented from searches for the standard model Higgs boson and proton-proton collisions at square root of s equals 7 and